Okay, so hi everybody. Welcome uh, to our uh, Caribbean Studies seminar series. Um, we have the pleasure of welcoming um, Maria del Pilar Caladin um, today, um, who will be our speaker for this session. And the session is going to be chaired by Marta Fernandez Campa. So before we begin, um, there were just a few points I wanted to run over um, quickly. Firstly, this is the second to last um, event that we'll be holding as part of this academic year. Um, so our next event will be on the 14th of June and it will be again, at, it'll be at 4pm, so an hour earlier than today. Um, and we will be welcoming Katija George of, um, of the University of Brighton, and she'll be presenting a paper on uh, um, on a presentation entitled Black British Magazines Posed for Their True African Nature. Um, and that session will be chaired, chaired by Nick Brown. So please sign up for that um, as and when you can. I'll put the link in the chat right now for you, uh, just so that we can get that going. And uh, also, I did want to invite you, for those of you who are interested, I was just told today about um, two events that are taking place. So there's one event that is on the 22nd of May, which is a Haitian Flag Day, um, which is being organised by the Haitian Heritage Group um, in London. And it's going to be a fantastic event being held at the Calthorpe Community Garden um, from 1 to 6 on on. Sunday the 22nd so if anybody wants to go you're all welcome and please and please just go along to that and also I've been told that the Haiti support group will be celebrating their 30 year anniversary on the 18th of June and they're going to be having a big party at, at the, um, the Haitian restaurant Grill Shack and Tiki Bar again in London and um, I've been promised the best room in town so if anybody would like to um to sign up for that and come along to a bit of a celebration really um not just uh, well to celebrate Haiti as well, but also as a way of celebrating these uh, these um, these sessions that we've been holding over the past year. Please just come along. Um, and finally, um, some of you have already been in contact. We've got a waiting list of people who are eager to present their work from uh, in the next academic year, from September or October. Um, if you want to present, I'll put my email in the chat for you. Um, and please feel free to write to either myself or my colleague Jack Webb and um, with an abstract, a proposed title, um, and yeah, a little bit about, about um, a short bio basically, and we will do our best to accommodate, um, but there is a lot of interest for these sessions, so please uh, just, um, yeah, make sure you get in early because we'll be confirming those dates over the summer. Um, and just finally, a quick reminder, Basically, that these all, um, as I said, these sessions have been organised by um, by my great colleague Jack Webb as well, who's in the background, and maybe give us a wave on the call if you can see him. Um, and uh, just to remind you that we will be recording the the Q Q and A session as well um, for this uh, presentation. So if you do want to ask a question, you will be on camera. Um, and if you're if you maybe um, don't want to be on camera, then you're welcome to ask us a question via the chat facility, and we'll be do our best to accommodate. So um, without further ado, then I will pass over the reins to Marta, who will introduce uh, Maria for today's session. Thank you. Thanks, Eve. And thank you for the invitation to chair this event and welcome everyone. My name is Marta Fernandez Campa. I am an independent scholar and academic with a focus on poetics of memory in Caribbean literature and visual art and on literary archives. And I've most recently I've been working as a senior research associate in the Caribbean Literary Heritage Research Project based at the University of East Anglia. Um, I'm greatly looking forward to the talk and the reading today, and I'm delighted to be introducing Maria. Uh, Maria del Pilar Caladin is the co-editor of um, We Mark Your Memory, the first international anthology on the system of indenture in the British Empire. I'm going to now display it. It's a beautiful book. Her life writing has been published in Wasafiri and the anthology Mother Country, Real Stories of the Windrush Children, which was long listed for the Jalak Prize in 2019. She is the lead editor of the anthology The Other Windrush Legacies of Indenture in Britain's Caribbean Empire, published by Pluto Press in 2021. And um, here as well. Yes. <laughs> um, so, Today, 
um, just just as a kind of brief introduction, I'll just be speaking very briefly about the book to introduce, introduce and, and provide a little bit of a framing. And then um, Maria will be um, delivering her talk and reading. I just want to remind as well, um, people that, you know, you can um, share any comments as well and questions. Um, so we'll go back to that as well at the end for the Q&A. So in their introduction to The Other Windrush, Legacies of Indenture in Britain's Caribbean Empire, editors Maria del Pilar Caladin and David Dabaidin framed the historical significance of this anthology published last year in relation to the collective representation, but also in some way misrepresentation and imagination of the migration journey and experiences of the Windrush generation and the lives of their descendants. They write, I'm quoting now from the book, Far too few people in the United Kingdom know about the system of indenture in the Caribbean and the people of Chinese and Indian descent that it's left in the region. Fewer still are aware that alongside African Caribbean people, the descendants of those these indentured laborers formed part of the Windrush generation of migrants from the region to Britain during 1948 to 1971. End of quote there. This historical omission in narratives of Windrush is captured in the title, The Other Windrush, to reflect the position of a, um, quote, minority within a minority, as the editors note. A shared element that features in the chapters of this anthology are the challenges and hostility of the ongoing racism enacted upon migrants and their descendants in Britain, and also in other places um, in the migration, places of migration that are captured as well in the stories. I'm thinking here, for example, about uh, Canada. There seems to be also a connecting thread featuring many forms of kinship and the formation of community and solidarities among Indian and, and Chinese Caribbean and African Caribbean migrants, which sometimes also happened in their union and struggle against the per pervasive hostile environment still happening today. This anthology features 11 contributions written by a diverse group of people working in acting and the arts, journalism, healthcare, academic, um, literary and cultural scholarship and writing. Authors include Jonathan Pang, David Dabaidin, Eli Nyland, Nalini Mohabir, Bom Ramtani, Laini Malkani, Gordon Warnek, Tao Li Goff, Maria Del Pilar Kaladin, Mr. G, and Charlotte Bailey. Contributors share li about life stories of migration from Trinidad, Guyana, and Jamaica. Predominant in those are not only the hardships by cultural and social gatherings, um, sorry, not only the hardships encountered in Britain, but also the source of resistance and connection provided by cultural and social gatherings, food, music, childhood and, childhood and youth memories in the Caribbean, letters and photographs. The rich and layered textuality and visuality in these pages is a powerful testimony and legacy of intimate ways of imagining, thinking and making sense of the past in the present um, that is in dialogue with those memories of ancestors. The author's personal form of writing their history and those of their families and other migrants makes the contributions from this anthology rituals in terms of approaches and methodologies for engaging with oral histories. The chapters include memoir through the compilation of personal memories and family recollections captured in interviews, interwoven historical um, context, references, reflections, biographic detail, photo and photographic records from family albums and archives. They trace stories of how the past shapes the present, the author's memories and those of their ancestors shape and influence um, their sense of self. So though the chapters powerful disrupt a colonial logic of classification and categorization, they're not written exclusively um, in response to the silences and misrepresentation in colonial and other official archives or records, including the media. They share diasporic reflections on the legacies of indenture from other memories, experiences, and archives at their center. There is a strong sense of the multiple and complex ways in which family stories of Windrush migration, um, and perhaps also the process of writing about those has had a significant um, effect um, and influence on contributors. And I just wanna end this brief introduction to this vital publication by citing Hanif Qureshi's words on the anthology. A fitting tribute to the experiences of migration, struggle, and celebration that shaped those communities born out of Caribbean indenture. Okay, so now I'm just going to, um, yeah, let um, Maria 
take over. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. That was a beautiful introduction. Many, many thanks. In the 19th century, following the abolition of slavery, almost 2 million Indians were taken by the British to labor on colonies across the empire. Working largely, but not solely on sugar plantations, they were bound to work for periods of around five years under contracts called indentures. The regulations governing indenture varied from colony to colony, but generally, after 10 years residence, Indians could apply for a return voyage to India. Few chose to do so, with the result that Indian communities are found across the Commonwealth as part of the legacy of the indenture system. In addition to Indians, around 18,000 Chinese indentured laborers were brought to the Caribbean between 1853 and 1881. Indenture was not slavery. It was a system of unfree labor that restricted the movements of the workers and subjected them in many cases to serious abuses. Contracts regarding how long laborers could work and what they would be paid were regularly violated and the law was used to maintain control over workers rather than offer them any real recourse to justice. Indentured workers were taken by the British to Mauritius, South Africa, Sri Lanka, Fiji, Malaysia, and to various parts of the Caribbean. Between 1948 and 1971, the descendants of Caribbean indentured laborers traveled to the UK, my father among them, as part of Generation Windrush. I want to read out this quote from the sociologist Stephen Vertovec, which I used in social media since the release of the edited anthology, The Other Windrush. And that's, um, as Marta said, is a book which brings together stories from descendants of indentured laborers from India and China, whose parents or grandparents were also part of the Windrush generation. I'm, I'm gonna begin quoting Steve here. Indo-Caribbean peoples in Britain have been overlooked by observers of all kinds, academics, the media, and the general public alike. They have been miscategorized in official statistics and in social perception, and they have been misunderstood by almost all they have come into contact with in this country. Such a variety of obfuscations by others, contrasting with their own self-knowledge of a long history, vibrant culture, and firm identity, both before and after settling here, has been foremost in the experience of Indian Caribbeans in Britain. I'm going to revisit this quote later on in the talk today. So this is from an essay that Stephen Bertovec wrote in the 90s. Um, and I want to revisit the quote later on in the talk today to examine why the second sentence doesn't necessarily resonate with the second and third generation of Indian Caribbeans in the UK this idea of having a strong connection um, to your Indian Trinidadian or Indian Guyanese um, identity. I, I want to begin by exploring some of the reasons why Indians under indenture moved from being a celebrated presence in the Caribbean with specific reference to Guyana, to figures that were and still are largely unseen as part of the Windrush generation and their descendants here in the UK. I would like to suggest that the existence of Indian people in the Caribbean from the perspective of Britain has been one of appropriation followed by amnesia, and that much of the process of forgetting about indenture that has taken place in the UK is related to the uncomfortable position that the system occupies in British history, following as it did the abolition of slavery. I want to also acknowledge that Indians effectively disappear from the colonial narratives as soon as they are deemed to be no longer useful to the project of empire. As the industry around cane sugar dis diminished and beet sugar took over, gone were the romanticized depictions of Indians in the Caribbean by writers like William Agnew Patton, Charles Kingsley and Anthony Trollope, who all visited the Caribbean and, and wrote about indenture. Following the abolition of the use of enslaved labor in 1834 and the termination of the apprenticeship system in 1836, the British plantocracy sought to locate a source of cheap labor with which to continue profiting from the manufacture of sugar in places like Mauritius and the Caribbean. 
When John Gladstone, father of the future British Prime Minister William Gladstone and owner of two plantations in Guyana, heard about the transportation of indentured labourers to Mauritius, he wrote to the Calcutta firm Gelanders Arbuthnot to inquire about the possibility of sending indentured workers from India to the Caribbean. The affirmative response from Calcutta triggered the start of the system of indenture in the Caribbean, a system that would ultimately send around half a million Indians to work on sugar plantations in the region and would eventually spread from there across the British Empire. In 1840, John Scoble and the Anti-Slavery Society presented the first defined objections to the system of indenture. In a tract called Hill Coolies, a brief exposure of the deplorable condition of the Hill Coolies in British Guyana and Mauritius, and of the nefarious means by which they were induced to transport to these colonies. John Scoble used as evidence letters written by, by um, Gillanders and Arbuthnot that had sent the first indentured labourers to Mauritius in 1834. Much of Scoble's language in the tract sought to represent the indentured as victims in need of a saviour. And this is typical of the writing of the first decade of indenture, where activists against indenture who protested what they referred to as a new system of slavery, presented Indians as the helpless prey of recruiters and the Caribbean plantocracy and British civil servants advocating the system represented them as improved by the system. We can quite consistently describe discourse about indenture in the first few decades of the system as taking place over the bodies of the indentured laborers. And with a few exceptions, their voices are almost entirely absent. Ultimately, opposition to indenture was never strong enough to overcome the power of the West Indian sugar lobby and the colonial secretary of state, Lord John Russell, who had famously referred to his reluctance to sanction what he believed could become a new system of slavery, allowed indenture to continue in spite of what he accurately envisaged would become a race between abuses against Indians under indenture and legislation to reform these abuses. As Howard Temperley wrote in his study of British anti-slavery after abolition, despite these developments and the outspoken terms in which they denounced the Gladstone slave trade, British abol abolitionists were not in principle opposed to emigration. What could be more desirable, John Sturge reminded the First World Anti-Slavery Convention, than that a steady stream of labourers should flow into the colonies. Sugar would be raised in almost unlimited quantities and at a low price, enough to undersell the bloodstained produce of other nations. The economics of Brazil and Cuba would flounder, the slave trade would fade away, and the British experiment, pure and unsullied, would emerge triumphant. I'm gonna end that quote from Howard Templey there. If we were to take away one idea from the first period of indenture, it should be that in spite of the evidence presented against the system, evidence that was collected by the colonial Indian government and Scoble himself, who went to British Guyana to see the system firsthand, it would be that the fate of the Indians did not preoccupy anyone sufficiently for them to attempt a real halt to the system. And it was left to the Indians themselves, who agitated on plantations and later in writing, to self-advocate, which on many occasions they did to devastating effects. In previous research, I traced the extent to which colonial figures such as magistrates and judges in Guyana were motivated by injustices in the system of indenture and attempted to attack it by writing back to the imperial center. These efforts typically occurred after uprisings or any agitation on sugar estates and a clear pattern emerges from which we might see colonists and Indian working in a curious uncoordinated tandem to agitate for reform. In the case of Guyana, three of the most outstanding examples of this are William DeVoe, who worked as a stipendiary magistrate in the colony, the colony's chief justice, Joseph Beaumont, and John Edward Jenkins, who was a barrister who was sent to observe the first formal inquiry into indenture in 1870. As an example of how this pattern worked, in 1869, following an uprising on plantation Leonora 
that was triggered by overseas abuse of physical abuse of in Indian indentured workers. Devoe wrote a letter to the colonial secretary of state, heavily criticizing the behavior of the colonists towards the Indians. His letter prompted the first formal inquiry into indenture in Guyana. This inquiry was attended by the barrister John Edward Jenkins, who went on to write The Cooley, His Rights and Wrongs, a book based on his experiences in the colony. Perhaps the strangest episode in this period is that following his return to England, Jenkins heard about a subsequent uprising on a different plantation, which resulted in police shooting dead five laborers in an attempt to gal and in an attempt to galvanize popular opinion against the system. John Edward Jenkins wrote a love story, a novel, Lutchmi and Dilu, based on the lives of two laborers struggling to survive the corruption of the plantation system in Guyana. It must be said in relation to all three of these men that their concern for and veneration of Indians in the Caribbean was always at the expense of African Guyanese, who they subjected in writing to violent racism. And their texts were very much part of an effort at the time to construct Indians in the Caribbean in colonial discourse as embodying all the characteristics the African Guyanese were portrayed in the same discourse as lacking. From the 1890s onwards, it became impossible for the plantocracy and colonists to continue to portray Indians as the docile and passive saviors of the sugar industry. The sugar industry itself was in trouble, and as planters violated workers' contracts to increase profits, Indians pushed back dramatically. As an Indian Guyanese middle class slowly began to emerge, the concerns of Indians in the colony on and off the plantations began to be raised in the colony's press. And by the time the system of indenture was abolished in 1917, the community had a firm and resounding voice, needing no one to advocate on their behalf. The following letter printed in the Daily Chronicle in 1911, relating to whether or not Indian children could be exempt from Christian catechism, was typical of the tone of writing of the period. At last, we hear a few words from the high pedestal occupied by the immigration agent on the education of us poor East Indians. By the long observed silence from that central depot, the place which decides the destinies of the East Indian immigrants, we were inclined to believe that the Supreme Oracle was never going to exhibit interest on such minor points as the education of the East Indians of British Guyana. Let us hearken very attentively to the words that have come like the Sermon on the Mount to us and grasp the meaning of them very clearly. I want to return before I move on to a reading from the other Windrush to the second part of Steve Vertevec's quote. Um, let me see if I can just momentarily pull it up for you. You know what, I can't, but I'll read it out for you, that's fine. Um, Such a variety of obfuscations by others, contrasting with their own self-knowledge of a long history, vibrant culture and firm identity, both before and after settling here, has been foremost in the experience of Indian Caribbeans in Britain. So for me, while there's no doubt that that was true for the first generation of Indian Caribbean migrants to the UK, it certainly wasn't my experience growing up. And I hope that what we've all achieved in the anthology, in the making of the other Windrush contributors, editors, is a space for us to say what it has meant for us to be part of this migration. And I'd like to read um, I'm going to read uh, from, from my chapter, but I'd also like to read a little from the introduction. Um, before I do that, I'm just going to go over the slides from the first part of the, from the first part of the presentation. So let me share the screen. Okay, um, so this is my this is my dad. This is his passport. He came to um, he was born in 1938. So my dad was born exactly a hundred years after Indians first arrived in Guyana, um, and he came to England in 1961, and that's his that's his passport there. Um, so he would have been 23 when he came. 
Um, this is the quote I was talking about from Stephen Vertebeck, and I, I really do appreciate the first part of this quote. Um, I, I'm just bearing in mind the time that it was written. I, I don't think it has, the second part has, um, has relevance to um, perhaps to my generation and subsequent generations. Um, but this idea, um, this idea is the idea that we are kind of missing in action from um, from British history is um, is something that's felt, I think, quite strongly by Indian Caribbean people. Um, so this is John Scoble, the author of the tract Hill Coolies. Scoble and the Anti-Slavery Society presented the first defined objections to the system of indenture, using as evidence the letters written to contract labourers. Um, I would emphasise that Scoble kind of started a tradition of, um, of representing uh, indentured labourers as victims in need, in need of saving. And I think that that continued in, until it became untenable in the face of um, Indians' own opposition to, um, to colonial rule and to the rigours of the plantation. Um, I've laid out here, because I think this is quite important, because this, these three men turned out to be, um, they were all in the colony at the same time. And I think their presence just generated, um, it generated not only that, um, that commission of inquiry that I refer to, which is so important in Indian Guyanese history, but also just the, the fact of them being there and all working, um, and all working within the law at the time. Um, that's the letter of the Daily Chronicle. I added Chedi Jagan here because I thought I wanted to present a line of um, kind of a line of resistance to indenture. And I thought, well, where better to end it than, um, uh, you know, than, I mean, I, I guess, you know, in the other Windrush, we were presenting our own sense of, of resistance. But I thought where better to end it here because um, Chedi Jagan was the child of indentured labourers. And uh, he went on to fight for Guyanese independence forming the um, People's Progressive Party in 1950. And there's a, there's a lovely chapter in the other Windrush about Chedi Jagan. Okay, so this is from the introduction for the other Windrush and it's um, the, the, the introduction is called My Father's Journey Made Me Who I Am. Despite the strong sense of, ident of Caribbean identity that connects the contributors to this book, many of us have experienced throughout our lives the blank looks of those who have struggled to place us when we respond to that most loaded of questions. Where are you from? Far few people in the United Kingdom know about the system of indenture in the Caribbean and the people of Indian and Chinese descent that it left there. Fewer still are aware that alongside African Caribbean people, the descendants of these indentured laborers form part of the Windrush generation. While this book reflects on the challenges experienced by a community who have effectively lived their lives as a minority within a minority, it is also a celebration of what has been made possible in spite of our invisibility to the general population and the creative ways that we have resisted the silence that surrounds our cultural history. It is unsurprising that Indian Caribbean and Chinese Caribbean people should continue to be largely absent from European versions of colonial history. What has always superseded the discussion of Britain's benefit from close to two centuries of African enslavement in the Caribbean is a narrative of imperial benevolence that continually draws attention to the British abolition of the slave trade. Traditionally, this narrative has ignored the system of indentured labor that supplanted it. Within decades of the inception of indenture, a minority of Chinese and Indian Caribbean people were able to access schools and liberate their children from the plantation system. In a few cases, they were able to go overseas for tertiary education. Even before Indian Caribbean migrants left the region as part of the Windrush generation, an Indian Guyanese man named William Hewley Wharton had completed his study of medicine at the University of Edinburgh in 1899. He returned to the colony to work as a doctor. The Chinese Trinidadian bacteriologist Joseph Lennox Parwo 
whose work on rabies had global significance, also studied at Edinburgh University, completing his degree in 1912. Achievements like this are likely had to have been a source of inspiration to others who saw in Britain a place where they might access higher education and wide opportunities. And there is no doubt that these ideas filter down to many in the Windrush generation. Despite the fact that they have emerged from a little known community, descendants of indenture have participated in the formation of a British Caribbean identity from the earliest moments of their arrival. It is widely recognized that the NHS is indebted to the workers of the Windrush generation and a number of the contributors to this book, so myself, Mr. G, Nalini Mohabir and Jonathan Pang, had parents or relatives who worked in the NHS. Indian Trinidadian novelists Samuel Selvon and V.S. Naipaul, who both arrived in the UK in the 1950s, ignited literary fires that inspired later Windrush writers like David Dabadeen, whose poetry volume, Cooley Odyssey, is a journey into the double migrations of Indian indenture and Windrush. Dabadeen's work as an academic and writer was made possible not only by the creation of the Centre for Caribbean Studies at the University of Warwick in 1984, but also through the establishment of publishing houses which supported the work of Caribbean writers and scholars. Jeremy Pointing's Leeds-based People Tree Press, for example, published work by Chinese Guyanese writers Jan Lo Shineborn and Mei Ling Jin. And Jin's poetic work, Gifts from My Grandmother, deserves a special mention here, not merely for the spare, precise and powerful poetry, but also for its important recounting of Jin's early experiences of life in the UK as a Windrush child of Chinese ancestry. People Tree's contribution to Indian Caribbean literature through the publication of authors both here and in the Caribbean is unparalleled. Indian Guyanese Windrusher Arif Ali, founder of Hanseed Publications, played an important role in the academic development of Indian Caribbean studies. In 1987, Ali published the groundbreaking India in the Caribbean and Benevolent Neutrality, Indian Government Policy and Labour Migration to British Guyana. He also republished the founding text of indentureship studies, Hugh Tinker's A New System of Slavery, the Export of Indian Labour Overseas. The first two of these books were timed to commemorate 150 years since the arrival of the first indentured labourers in Guyana in 1938. And alongside publications in the University of Warwick, in the University of Warwick's Macmillan Caribbean series, they became key texts for the next generation of indentured scholars. Beyond educational institutions, Roy Saw and barrister Rudy Narayan, whose life journalist, journalist Lainey Malkani reflects on in, in this anthology, focused on work that can be interpreted as expressions of solidarity with African Caribbean communities who bore the brunt of the institutional discrimination that marked life in the UK in the 1970s and 80s. Roy saw through his public speaking at Hyde Park and Rudy Narayan through his legal work from his offices in Brixton. Their efforts defied the divisive politics that marked Guyana following the race riots of the 1960s and which feature heavily as the inspiration behind the work of spoken word poet, Mr. G in his contribution to this book. Bob Ramdani's oral history interview, another chapter in the book, goes some way to showing a contemporary audience what Tao Lee Goff refers to in her chapter as the strategic essentialism of black as a political identity. As Mr. G's chapter shows, however, these early sol solidarities became harder to locate in the decades that followed and he reflects on this in his recounting of life in the 1990s as a child of an African Ugandan father and Indian Guyanese mother. In 2018, the 70th anniversary of the arrival of the Empire Windrush at Tilbury Docks was marred by revelations that elderly and vulnerable members of the Windrush generation and their children were wrongly threatened with deportation and in some cases incorrectly removed from the UK. The justifiable public outrage over these events surprised the current government, whose creation of an annual Windrush Day on June 21st was interpreted by many as a hasty scramble to repair the severely damaged public relations that resulted from these tragic events. 
Both the anniversary and the scandal have prompted a movement towards a wider understanding of the Windrush generation and its lesser known histories. The Migration Museum's 2017 exhibition, No Turning Back, displayed the family history of one storyteller who was both a descendant of Indian indentured laborers and the child of a Windrush migrant. The British Library's online exhibition, Windrush Stories, includes accounts of the experiences of descendants of indenture and Charlie Brinkhurst Cuff's Mother Country, Real Stories of the Windrush Children, contains tales by Windrush children of Chinese, Indian and Jewish descent. While this anthology focuses on the mobilities and migrations triggered by the creation of the system of indenture, in the case of Guyana, indigenous people of Amerindian heritage also migrated to the UK as part of the Windrush generation. Notable examples include the writer Pauline Melville and the artist George Simon. Speaking about the first generation of Indian indentured laborers to the Caribbean, historian Clem Citran has used the term collective amnesia to describe the community's silent agreement to forget the complex reasons that motivated each individual departure from India. The work of historians focusing on these very push factors tell us that these could include severe poverty, famine, domestic violence, a need to hide from authorities or being duped by recruiters. Jan Lo Scheinborn's excellent novel, The Last Ship, is an exploration of the roots and consequences of similar modes of forgetting in a Chinese Guyanese family. As far as the children of the other Windrush are concerned, these first generation silences could sometimes be fortified by their own parents' reticence to discuss their early lives in the UK in order to shield their children from painful stories of discrimination. While understanding their origins, this book seeks to challenge these silences, sharing aspects of the stories of our parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents, and showing how much our own lives have de been defined by the bravery that mo mo motivated their multiple journeys and their lives. The seeds of this anthology were sown in 2017 when the editors convened an oral history panel at the University of London to amplify the voices of descendants of indenture who were also part of the Windrush gen generation. Sharing aspects of her father's voyage across the Atlantic with the audience, Professor Heidi Sophia Mertzer reflected on what this meant for her. My father's journey, she said, made me who I am. One cannot look upon her work as an academic who has sought to expose the injustices encountered at the intersections of race and gender and not immediately understand that her comment encapsulates the understanding that at its best, to be part of the Windrush generation was to belong to a community of resistors whose support for one another operated in defiance of the hostile environment recounted here. Okay, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna end my talk with a reading from my chapter for, um, uh, for the volume, which is Everything of Us. Um, it's not It's not because it's the best chapter by any means, but it's, um, um, it's the one I wrote and I think you should hear it in my voice. Um, I can also add, there is actually a 50% discount on the other Windrush, um, I think until Thursday. So uh, I do encourage you, however you get hold of a copy <laughs> through a library or, or whether you order it, I, I do encourage you, if you're interested in, um, in the history of us as a community, um, do, do read it because it has some really incredible um, and varied narratives. So this is my, this is my piece, it's called Everything of Us. Since my mother died, I've been traveling for four hours, one day a week, out of London and back again. I have become aware that my dad was, as he put it, fading away, unable to hand his paper, handle his paperwork, inclined to forget what needed to be done, and housebound as the result of problems balancing. On the last occasion he went to the city center, he ambulated so precariously that the police on seeing him arranged for two paramedics to take him home. Even with the knowledge that he is approaching his 82nd year, the idea of my dad walking unsteadily is something I am still getting accustomed to. 
Since the early 80s, he had worked in London's best hotels as a silver service waiter. The weight of the trays he carried so easily in and out of ballrooms in order to feed his five children would have been immense to anyone else. But this job that gave him no time to think was what he most wanted, to be so tired that he could automatically shut down any voice that told him that he had failed, that he couldn't have traveled thousands of miles across a frigid ocean to an ice cold bedsit, to live amongst a lukewarm people, to become a waiter. He would come home late at night, quietly removing his shoes at the entrance to the house, as he must have done in Guyana as a boy. His bow tie would still be untied, but round his neck and his waistcoat still done up. He would remove the tools of his trade from his pockets, bottle opener, cigar cutter, pen. He would have been aware each night he came home to the house that he had not in any sense lived up to his father's dreams for him. His father, my grandfather, was the last of 10 children of an indentured laborer named Khalidin, who had arrived in British Guyana in 1881. Born in 1915, he was named Bihari, and he was the only one of his siblings to avoid a working life on the plantation. Bihari was apprenticed to another Indian Guyanese from whom he learned the skill of tailoring, eventually opening his own shop in Georgetown. He was a forward-thinking man who educated his daughters as well as his sons and who wanted more for his children. It was Bihari who anglicised our family name from Khalidin to Kaladin, keen that we should not be associated with the colonially acquired stain of Kali worship and that Indianness, while important to him, would not be the thing that held his children back. I understand that my grandfather was loved unreservedly by his children and respected in his community. On a monthly basis, he would make his home a dharamsala by feeding those who were needy in the community. In the heat of the Indian-African race riots of the 1960s, Bihari moved his family to Canada, where two of my father's siblings had already settled. He accepted this new world and its color bars without complaint, taking work as a doorman at the Hotel Fairmont, and he set to picking up the pieces of his life as the shepherd of the family. Guyanese people are not always kind with their words. However, I've never met one who said anything negative about my grandfather. His reputation as a good and kind man was sealed by his early death at 56 of an aneurysm. My father's brothers and sisters were crushed by this loss, made greater by the knowledge that they had not lived up to his educational expectations. But it was my dad, the second eldest, who left not just Guyana, but his entire family, who felt the death less and the sense of having disappointed him more. In the weeks after my mother died, my father spoke to me about his daily journey from his house to Peters Hall Primary School, grudgingly created by the colonial planters to educate the children on the plantation of the same name. B. Harry had gone to the same school as a boy and had the same teacher. This teacher, Teacher Solomon, would look at my dad fixedly at least once a week and with the, conf with the firm conviction that the intellectual apple had fallen far from the tree, she would say to him, wagging her finger and shaking her head, boy, you are nothing like your father. In many of our conversations, we would return to this walk to school and to the people and events of this time. And it was in the telling and the retelling of these stories that he seemed sometimes to finally understand that my mother, who he had asked for intermittently since her death, was not coming back. Things had been bad between my parents in the months before my mother died. In the hospital, she refused to see him. There was nothing irregular in this. In over 55 years of marriage, they had never managed to find a way to live together without conflict. In the weeks after the ambulance brought him home, he stopped going out. The little he did to help out in the house dwindled away to nothing and she became responsible for every single meal, wash plate and hoovered carpet. He retreated in, into himself and she would call me angry, resentful, hinting darkly that she had concerns about her own health. Eventually, they stopped talking to each other, a pattern that they had established during ch my childhood, when one furious bust up could lead to years of silence. 
For the majority of my school years, they did not talk at all. But my older brothers remember a time when things were different, when they would occasionally communicate without friction. But they also remember having to physically come between them. And if I try, I too remember these moments. I can see the pieces of her radio scattered on a carpet because he smashed it in that way he had of letting her know that he was the boss and she was nothing. My parents were the sort of people who should have been very particular about who they married and how many children they had. My mother, a fair-haired, blue-eyed Galician from the north of Spain, should have settled for someone as glacial as herself. Then she would not have spent the remaining decades of her life blaming her husband's culture and her children's mixedness for the mess of her life. My father should definitely not have had five children. He hated noise and he hated disorder. And in that singular Caribbean way, he believed that discipline was something that should be whacked into a child. Perhaps he should have married a woman lighthearted enough not to always take him literally, who understood the Guyanese need to perform, that what we say is not necessarily true, that sometimes it's more about how it sounds, that words and their meanings can sometimes have separate lives. There had been signs before, but they are never really signs before, are they? In truth, they become what we have decided to see after the fact. It was difficult to tell if his memory had deteriorated after his first joke. He gets very confused, my mum would say, but she didn't take it further and I didn't press her. I wondered if this confusion was just his way of shutting her down. Three months after she died, I arrived at the house and began to make coffee. My back was to him, so he didn't see my face when he asked me where mummy was. You don't remember? There was a long pause. I remember, he said, eyeing me as though I didn't have all the facts, but I can hear her sometimes moving around up there. With his head, he gestured to the room above her, us that had always been hers. There was a moderate sense of triumph in his voice, like when you're right, but you don't want to gloat. The next morning, I called the doctor and two days later, I received a call back. My father had been diagnosed with dementia four and a half years ago, they said. Was I sure he hadn't told anyone? So what did he do? Did he walk out of the clinic and decide not to tell anyone? Did he walk out of the clinic and forget his diagnosis? Did he walk out of the clinic and decide that he did not accept the diagnosis? I do remember that a couple of decades ago, he told me with real fear in his eyes that his grandmother had something like dementia before she died in her early 80s. This woman, Bichia, had come to Guyana as a little girl with her mother in 1876. She eventually became Caladine's wife. Whatever he decided that day, my mum died thinking that my dad had retreated into himself and ignored her own declining health. She never told him about the mass that she must have known was growing inside her. And by the time she went to the doctor, her undiagnosed cancer had metastasized. And within two weeks of arriving at the hospital, she was dead. Right up until the last moment, she had refused to see him. And so the marriage ended as it had endured on the back of misunderstandings and nurtured grudges. Inevitably, we have become time travelers in our weekly conversations. We talk a lot about that journey to his primary school in Guyana, along the road that ran past the cane fields. We talk about how he used to follow the road home, back, follow the road back home at lunchtime and see his uncles Colladine's sons and employees of the plantations peacefully engaged in their lunch. He told me that he hadn't wanted to disturb them as they looked so grateful for their break. Why, what would they have said? I asked him. Oh, you know, come here, boy. He says this in a gruff, affectionate way that I recognize immediately as the way he speaks to his grandsons. But of course, he's getting worse. His mind will not miraculously fuse itself back together and he will lose more of his memories. One day, quite recently, I told him that I was sorry that he never had an opportunity to share conversations like this with his own father. You were so young when he died, I said. My dad's not dead, he said, shaking his head, looking at me surprised. Two weeks later, he called me to ask what time his father was coming home from work. And when I tried to find out more, I understood that in his mind, the day before, his father, my mother and I had all been in the house with him, but now he was alone and he didn't understand why. 
But this is how I understand what's happening to him. Time is no longer linear and he sees everything of himself and his past together. In this way, nobody is dead and it is possible that he could be sitting in the room with his grandson, wondering when his own father will get back from work. Each week, as we travel along the road to Peters Hall Primary School, it feels as though we have moved a little further back in time, as though we are heading back to the beginning of that first day that he stepped out of the door to head off to school. My father's never spent a night in hospital, and one of the nurses who visits him at home told me this naturally makes him a terrible patient. He is unused to being unwell and has never taken medicine. Once, though, he was very seriously ill, but he doesn't remember this. When he was no more than a toddler, he had what would properly now be diagnosed as bronchiolitis. I know this because my uncle, my father's older brother, told me that he remembered their maternal grandfather, a striking looking South Indian man who spoke Tamil, coming to the house and asking his daughter, my grandmother, to let him take care of him. He took my dad away and returned him days later when he had recovered. I love this story because it encapsulated the wonder of extended family that I had never known in London. As a child, my father grew up with all but one of his grandparents. Only Culloden had died before he was born. I imagine this man, that family law has it, traveled to Guyana independently of the indenture system. I imagine him, handsome, dark-skinned and gray-haired, striding off down the road with my dad in his arms and his daughter looking on, safe in the knowledge that he could make everything right. In the coming months, my dad will forget many more things, but I hope that some fragment of this story about his grandfather will remain. The story of a man who loved his daughter, a daughter who trusted her father, and a child held secure and certain in the land of his birth, peaceful and unaware of all that he would one day leave behind. I'm going to stop there. I'd love to just share with you um, my very last slide. Um, let's see if I can. Yes. Which was, I mean, these are all very much family stories. So I just made this little collage of myself and my um, and my brothers. So you could see a little bit of my family. So, so photos are something that were really important in the creation of the other Windrush. And we tried to fit, um, as you know, I'm sure a lot of you will know, it's expensive to put color photos in books, but we tried to get as many black and white images of people's families as we could. So you could follow, uh, follow the stories of our grandparents and great grandparents along with us. Thank you. Thank you for listening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Maria, for such a rich and informative um, and thought provoking um, lecture and talk as well and reading. Thank you so much for that. Um, for that reading. So I just want to um, remind everyone to please share all comments and questions as well in the chat. And um, I'll be also, um, you know, checking that. I also put a link to uh, Pluto Press so that you can get, you know, if you don't have a copy, um, you can get a copy there. And there's, as Maria mentioned as well, there's the 50% um, um, discount right until the 12th of May. So make sure to check it out um thank you so right so as i say i, I encourage you I'm, I'm gonna start maria with a question and you know we can um give a little bit of time as well for other comments and, and questions coming through but um i was really struck and i i find that as well in your work so much right these um very very rich scholarship and also um, very kind of different types of scholarship that you include and different types of research and different types of writing that you include in your own work and that also figure as well very much in the anthology. Um, so I was wondering as well, and, and this is something that, you know, we've had also conversations uh, among ourselves about, right, how to find um, that kind of balance between finding your own voice, because one thing that I find in your writing 
um, and especially as well in these um, in these pieces that, of course, is very much it very much sounds like your own voice, which obviously, you know, it is your piece. But considering that you're also um, recounting and you are you're sharing as well memories from your family, memories from your ancestors, from your research. But I was um, I was wondering if perhaps you could talk a little bit as well about um, that process as well and of finding that. Um, or finding that balance as well, and perhaps how do these different forms of um, of research that you do, oral history research, and also research in archives, particularly in colonial archives, that I know um, is is part of your uh, of your work and your scholarship. So I was wondering if you could um, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I, th I think you know one of the nice things about um, uh, I think one of the nice things about um, perhaps coming from a less conventional academic background because I, I left school I left school when I was 15 and I I um I I did my um I did all the qualifications I needed to to do to go to university as an adult and um uh, which was I mean it's really hard I did it I did it while I was working like I mean left with no GCSEs it was it was it was a really difficult thing to do but it kind of um I have always felt like I was on my own little like I was on my own little little journey and in that sense I didn't have um I didn't really have a, a mentor or an idea of how I should write or how I should be an academic except for perhaps in a way David Dabadine who's the, the co-auditor of, of the other Windrush and if you look at kind of his writing it's very much a it's, ve it's very much kind of like an eruption of of uh, um of literary scholarship and life writing and poetry and fiction so I if I had been influenced by anyone it would be him and I, I think I, I, I'm very very grateful to him for for um um because he was uh, he was the only Indian guy and he's academic I knew for for a long time um I'm very grateful to him for kind of leaving that legacy of I'm going to call it a mess <laughs> Is it, I think it is in comparison to some of the paths that, that other academics um, follow, because it made me think, well, it's okay to do this. It hasn't hurt him. So, um, yeah, I, I, I guess also there's like, like um, at the age that I got my PhD, there was also less of a sense that I had to do stuff for, um, for the academy or for my career and more sort of, you know, well, you know, I have something to say. I'm just going to say it. if people want to read it, brilliant. Wouldn't that be a great added bonus? Brilliant. And that also ties as well with the question that I had as well of um, influences, but also in a way with the kind of sheer variety as well. And this is something that also, you know, that also um, is predominant in We Mark Your Memory, right? In terms of the different types of writing. So there is essay, there is also fiction, there is poetry, that kind of space as well for breaking through these cultures of amnesia through very different um, forms of writing, very different kind of styles as well. Yeah. And that's also, um, you know, taking place as well in, in the other wing brush, right? In the sense that, you know, the contributors also um, come from different um, uh, professional backgrounds and also um, are writing from, you know, with quite different um in quite different styles in a way even though there's there, there are really strong connections um underlying those but I was wondering in terms of the edit you know editing process and also your work of collaborating with um David Abidine and and in the past this is your um second anthology but I was wondering if that was something how, how was that process was that something kind of that happened more organically or was that something that you know that you both had in mind as as um how was that and also perhaps if you could speak a little bit about how that how did you which you do in your introduction at the end of the introduction you give a sense of how the project um this book um came together but that would be i think that would be yeah I'm, i must say i don't know if you can see this here if i do that so i've got framed the cover of we mark your memory behind me um so that that book i cannot you know i cannot take credit for the idea for that because that was a phenomenal woman at the Com uh, the commonwealth writers who's the head of the the commonwealth writers at the time janet Steele, who at the time that we were attempting to organize a conference around the centenary of the abolition of indenture i went to them to ask for some support or could we you know would you like to bring a writer to the university and um and janet um 
who also happens to be a descendant of Indian indentured laborers to South Africa. Um, Because sometimes you have to, that helps because sometimes you have to explain (laughs) system of indenture to people. And she said, well, why don't, the Commonwealth writers frequently do anthologies. Um, And they've done some, apart from We We Mark Your Memory, they've done some really, they've done some really fantastic collections. And she said, why don't we do an anthology? Why don't we try to get, you know, why don't we try to get somebody from every single country in the Commonwealth that used indentured labour in the 19th century to contribute a piece of fiction, of academic writing, of of poetry. And I think working on that, um, working on that book, um, for me was really, it was a it was a big moment because I realized how much I believe in the power of people collectively. Um, so um, I have an academic friend who's always, you know, saying to me, oh, monograph, monograph, you need to publish your monograph. And I kind of think, well, I don't really want to. I like working like this. I like working with other people. This is what, you know, kind of this is what brings me joy. I think we're all together in a room. That's what an anthology is like to me, is getting people together in a room, kind of chatting together and saying, oh, look at this, look at this, this is what happened to me. And this is, I love that. I love that style of being. I love that style of working. And so when we did it successfully with, with We Mark Your Memory, actually became the best-selling it's still the best-selling book for our publishers the University of London Press I I thought well we like making it people must have liked reading it it must have meant something to descendants of indentured labour who read it Um, and I wondered if there was a possibility of us doing something similar um, Mm -hmm. for this idea of indenture to Windrush. Brilliant thank you I mean both both collections but I think also your work um, is breaking ground in that sense as well, right? And in a way, as you were saying, you know, the, the contributors and, and those um, right, those pieces, are chapters in the book are also breaking those um, cultures of amnesia. And, um, and I wonder as well, I know that collaborations have also played a big role. And I wanted to mention as well, um, of course, the, um, the Journal of, uh, of Indentureship as well, um, that you are that you've that it's newly established so I don't know if um if you yeah. want to talk a little bit as well about that because I know that some of the contributors and 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 David Abidin are um, in the editorial board so yeah no no this is so this is a that's a um I mean that's a really that's a really important journal it's the first journal that only as if we mark your memory was the, it's the first anthology just to focus on um uh just to focus on indenture um across the british empire to bring collections of the the so the journal of indentureship studies is kind of hoping to do the same thing in a scholarly you know in a scholarly way and it's published by pluto journals and its second issue is coming out um it's coming out in june um I think, and it's yeah that's a that's, that's a really that's a really important endeavor but again i mean again it's something that's that's collective and I, I um, you know, as I said, I love that way of working, but I love the way, there's a, there's a metaphor that I use a lot to describe. Um, so in um, on the journeys from India to the Caribbean and to other places, there was a concept called Jahaji Bai, like ship brother or a ship sister. Um, and that relationship between you and the person that you traveled with your shipmate, it was considered to be so strong that you were like first cousins. And in the case of Hindu, in, in the case of Hindi, um, you would not, you would not marry, um, your children would not marry because that was a, that was a first cousin bond. So it was a familial bond. And um, I, for me, I love this idea kind of that internationally, I've worked with people um, in Fiji or in South Africa that I've never met in person. Um, but we have this shorthand, I think we have this profound connection as descendants of the Indian indentured labour diaspora. And I, I like, I like that um, metaphor of, um, of, of Jahaji Bai to describe our, our relationships and the projects we work on together. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, there is a question as well from, uh, from Eve. Hi, um, Maria, that was an excellent presentation. I really enjoyed it. I also enjoyed Aunt Manta's contributions as well at the beginning. I thought you worked really well together. Um, so thanks for taking the time to join us today. Um, my question is, because I'm from a very different scholarly tradition, right? So um, what I've, I've got your book here and really enjoyed reading it. Um, but my, my question, obviously what resonated with me immediately is the question of like erasure, right? So historical, historical erasure, forget, forgetting, but also how um, within, within scholarship as well, um, we, 
have the ability to basically you know completely eliminate certain voices right so it's not just the um it's not just the sources and the and the uh, and the people that we're critiquing within our kind of analysis but also we do it ourselves and um, we do it within the academy in the way that area studies is thought about and and organized um yeah the way the departments are organized um so i just found that really fascinating particularly because of this kind of also this kind of cultural gaze as well that 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 um uh that certain people or i would say in in the uk that we have about um about the caribbean right how it's formed how its people are formed what they represent um and all of these things are, are really limiting right they can be really they can be empowering and they can be in the case of your book because they can open all of these conversations and new avenues but they can also be very limiting in the sense that you can literally um wipe what uh yeah erase voices and experiences and everything like i just said so um i was just just to get your take on that really i think i think that was probably the common thread throughout the whole of this this session anyway um but i just wondered if you wanted to say maybe more about that for maybe some of us who are not from a literary tradition who enjoy engaging with the literature and um and having that kind of exposure to that kind of storytelling technique but maybe say more yeah, for, for the social scientists among us who, uh, yeah. who are getting a lot out of this. Yeah, I love like I, I love I mean I love the idea of um I love the idea of us all kind of um you know writing ourselves oh this generation of descendants of indenture writing ourselves into um uh into existence. I, I love the fact that we are all involved in challenging the silence um uh, that surrounds our our history in whatever way we do it you know whether we're doing it with food or um with dance or with um or or with anthologies and i one thing that um i think is quite special about this anthology is it's not uh, it's not um predominantly at all writers and academics it's people from um very different walks of life so for example jonathan pang is um is a chef and a food writer who wrote a beautiful book called The Pepper Pot Club. Um, and his um, he he actually opens the book, his chapter is the first chapter. And uh, um, he is not, a, in spite of the cookbook, he's not a professional writer. And um, the value of his of his contribution is um, is immense. I think there's something very special about approaching people who um, who are not typically asked to write um, and um, and seeing what they come back with. So the actor Gordon Warnick, who was in my, I think he's, he might be a bit more famous for EastEnders now, but he was in My Beautiful Laundrette with, um, with Daniel Day-Lewis. So he wrote a, a really lovely chapter about how, you know, his experiences as an actor and how people immediately, um, you know, immediately expected him um, um, to have Indian heritage and this challenge he had to go through auditions and people saying, oh, um, you know, but aren't you Indian? You know, don't you? And he would say, well, he did for a long time, he didn't say, and then he did eventually say, oh, well, I'm Guyanese, you know, and he met with that silence I speak with in the introduction. There's something really, really nice about kind of like, you know, having people in those. So good. I think Gordon and Jonathan are probably both in there in their mid fifties and you can imagine how wound up they must have been all these years having to kind of tell this story of their origins. And then, you know, you give them a chance to write and it's like, bam, you know, um, I, I actually have something to say about this. And it's um, in both cases, the something that they have to say is spectacular because both of them are children of women who came here on their own. Um, and that in itself is really important because there aren't enough Windrush narratives by uh, by and about women who came here on their own um and how they made that journey and how they supported themselves and oh, sorry you're muted. i was muted there <laughs> um thank you maria uh, there's also a question from a ellie kramer thank you hi ellie hi Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you, Maria, firstly, for such um, such a great talk. It was such it's such an interesting um, and important topic. So, um, yeah, I love listening to it. I had a quick question for you. Um, in my own research recently, actually, I've been looking at some um, papers about Chetty Jagan in particular, and I just noticed that were some 
um, kind of in the 50s, there were some letters between him and some activists in India, you know, um, kind of supporting each other and discussing kind of liberation movements. And I just wondered if you, um, within your own research, had come across um, many examples of those kind of connections between uh, kind of the Indian diaspora or the Chinese diaspora in the Caribbean and um, kind of individuals, I guess, in their not necessarily homeland is probably not the right word, but those kind of connections that go backwards in a sense. Yeah, no, I haven't. But, you know, it's funny, actually, because I saw a picture um, uh, recently. I saw when I was doing this presentation, I was looking for a nice picture of, um, of uh, Chendi Jagan because um, I wanted to I really wanted to put him in the um, in in the narrative. And I uh, saw a picture of him garlanded and he it looked to me like he was in India. Um, and I thought to myself, oh, well, that's, um, you know, uh, um, that's a story for someone. I know that um, my colleague, Mr. G, who's written a really, he's written a really a beautiful chapter in, um, in, in the book called Three Rivers. And it's his own story of his journey um, as someone of Indian Guyanese and African Ugandan heritage. And um, he centers very much on, um, on Chedi Jagan um, as a think as a figure who was really celebrated in his mum's family, um, and what that um, and you know what that meant for him, and he went to the archives at Senate House. I don't know if you know that there is a, the library has a has a, a small archive collection of um, writings. Yeah. Yeah, so he would be, it's a shame he's not here today, so because he would be, um, he would perhaps be better equipped to um, to share those with you. But um, it's, it's like, you know, I put that picture of Chedi Jagan in there and it's like, I said, my dad is still with us. So I visit him once a week um, in, uh, in a care home. He's really frail, but his memories of Guyana are very strong. And one of his, one of his kind of most, um, one thing that he remembers very well is he was a stenographer in um, uh, in the parliament in Guyana. He remembers Chedi Jagan very well. He remembers him being a very kind of striking figure, a very striking man. And so when I see, because um, uh, my my like my work has always been kind of around nineteenth century um, colonial colonial British history, and when I see that photo that was part of the presentation, I automatically think of my dad. You know, think gosh, you know, in his mind. <clears throat> Uh, what in his mind, the mind of all Indian Guyanese people, he must have been a huge figure, right? Because he came from, you know, he came from that plantation background. Both his parents were um, were workers on plantation Moran, I think. And um, uh, yeah, it was. I mean, he was an incredible symbol of what um, of of the journey of um, of Indian Guyanese people from mm. you know uh, from from plantation to tertiary education. In his case, in one generation. Yeah, thank you. I mean, just to, just to follow up, I think he actually did go to uh, India. I think it was in it was in the early fifties because I yeah I saw that he was in he was in Britain and him and Forbes Burnham I think uh, went to India. So and I think that's maybe where some of those connections when yeah. he maybe made some of those connections. But I, I was really interested to see no. to understand kind to think a bit more about how yeah. you mentioned earlier in your talk about. Um, I don't know because the, the kind of I guess the second and third generations of um, of migrants from the Caribbean here. Um, my um, my grandmother is Indo Trinidadian, but oh, wow. I always wonder about those. Like it doesn't yeah. feel like there's for me personally it doesn't feel like there's that much of a connection yeah. to those you know, Indian roots necessarily. But it was interesting to see in in Jagan's papers that there was some kind of that he had some kind of connections and relationship to India. So I just wondered. So, that yeah. Kind of question, but no, no. Your research you. sounds. I'm really, I'm really, I'm really happy to hear about what you're doing. It sounds like amazing research. So yeah. Um, thank you, but no, thank you very much anyway. For, um, if thanks. anyone else has got a question, so thanks for thanks for being thanks for being here. Thank you, and I'm going to read as well two comments, and then um, we have another question as well. So there was a comment from Thomas uh, said, um, said thank you so much, uh, Maria. Such a moving conclusion. Um, when you read yeah, your, your piece from the anthology. And there's also as well a comment uh, from N. Armour. Uh, thank you, Maria Kaladin, for a wonderful presentation. Would like to discuss this topic more. And I believe um, there's a question as well from uh, Moore. 
thank you. Hello. Hi. Thank you so much. Maria Kalagini. I know I don't know why I call people by both first and second names. My children tell me off about this all the time. But um, it was, yes, it was really wonderful your presentation. And just thank you so much for sharing that, you know, your excerpt from the book. Very personal, you know, and very touching. Um, and I was... Yeah, I was struck by uh, your reference to Professor Clem Sicheran, whom I had the the privilege of having as my as my tutor when I did a, a Caribbean studies degree, and 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 hearing him talk about this collective amnesia, which which also could be, I suppose, extrapolated, and in a way, he did do that, you know, during the years that we were with him, when when we would have conversations around, you know, kind of around slavery coming out of the continent of Africa, you know, and, and not people not kind of wanting to face up to hard truths. And history is one of those sites that is, you know, it's a site of, of a lot of emotion and uh, contestation and so on. And, and I think it's really important, you know, that, that you, that you reference that because it isn't, it isn't just, you know, in the context of, of, um, Indian indentureship, but also, of course, African slavery and all sorts of other, you know, areas of history. So thank you for that. Really yeah. important. Uh, thank you so much for coming. It's, it's, that's interesting because it's something that M Marsha and I um, talk a lot about this idea of, of memory and remembering. And just as I was walking home today, I was thinking there are so many kind of mentions of, you know, amnesia and memory. And, and then in my dad's case as well, the story the story that I'm I was reading out is about you know um the memories that he's held on to and those that are kind of slipping away from him so it's like it seems kind of you've you've really picked up the theme of um of the day yeah yeah, yeah it's I found it really important um and lovely hearing you talk about Jahaji Bai and sort of explaining that and I've put in the chat it's um if people click on it that I don't know if you if you know that it's a calypso that yeah. came out. You know, it's so it's so lovely you've put that there because I would never have thought to, and it's actually referenced by Mr. G in the chapter that I was talking about. Okay. Um, yeah, and it's, it's it's very very moving what he's saying about how he saw this performed in Trinidad and, and the effect that it had on him as a young man. Um, yeah to hear this man singing um, about his identity as though it was something yeah. to be celebrated. And, and, um, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. And then there was a lot of, um, you know, there were, there were elements of serious criticism when he came out with that song because people were saying, oh my God, it's like historically inaccurate and what are you saying? And, and sort of missing the kind of the bigger picture, which was about togetherness, about unity, about us, you know, living on on in this space and it's a beautiful help. song. It's it's a really beautiful song. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks a lot for your presentation. Thank you for that um, for that comment um, and that uh, and that intervention. Yes, and I was thinking as well. You know, when you were mentioning. Um, Maria, I was going back to your the piece that you've read from your contribution to the anthology. Um, I'm always struck about how um, beautifully you write about your family and with such um, tenderness, but, but on honesty as well, which in many ways um, sort of is, is the kind of complete opposite to what you know the narratives many times, right? Have um, have portrayed that we can find in more official, uh, in more official archives. Where also, you know, affect is missing as well. Um, but I was, yeah, I was struck as well. You know, the way that you um, write as well the um, the relationship of your parents, but also how you know your mum, your mother, having migrated also also from from the north of Spain, from Galicia, and having also. Um, the experience of the silences of the Spanish Spanish Civil War, um, and how you know, and and the ways in which the that kind of cultural of amnesia, of amnesia in the Caribbean, and that context, you know, of the colonial culture and coloniality of the Caribbean, but also 
um, in the case of your mother as well, um, having that kind of pressure of um, of the of the silencing of that um, yeah. historical moment yeah. of the war and how that might have been in ways as well um, been there, right, and been kind of um, part of that of of their relationship. And it, I, I was also thinking, you know, the way that you presented first you know in the, in the first part of your presentation when you were talking about you know um archival research and and drawing as well into the 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 less known perhaps particularly in the public sphere and the kind of you know um um collective imaginary of the um great history of uh, acts of uh, uprising from the indenture communities in the Caribbean, but also as well, the kind of the key role that the colonial um, governments and colonial powers in the Caribbean sort of played in, term, in terms of dividing as well across ethnicity and across um, that kind of racial and, and ethnic divide as well, how it was kind of deliberately, you know, through policy um, and through kind of, you know, societal structures. And, and, and it kind of got me thinking as well, right, about how you know, the fact that um, narratives of Windrush in a way here in the UK have reproduced that kind of division in a way, in a sense as well. And it just kind of, yeah, it, it got me thinking about how, and this obviously not just being something that takes place um, here in the UK, but that is very much in the social fabric, right, of um, former colonial uh, powers in countries, neighboring countries. I'm thinking of France and Spain, how those kind of, you know, um, strategies of divide and conquer already still kind of permeate, right? Still sort of uh, are being used very much um, in the sort of social studies school or, or political landscape. So anyways, these are just some sort of um, thoughts that came through from, from those um, you know those um, different parts of your of your talk and kind of interrelated. Yeah, there's a, there's a link I put up, Marta. That um, I'd, I'd love to if if people have the time. There's a lovely event that I was part of the Commonwealth Foundation, and as you were, you were kind of pointing to the you know the the kind of pushback across periods of of um, the pushback against the the silencing. So this event for the Commonwealth Foundation, if we took. Three um, three pieces of writing. So one was fiction, and two were historical accounts. Um, uh, one of, of testimony of indentured laborers. We gave it to actors and to writers, and they perform monologues um, based on, um, in one case, the testimony of an Indian indentured woman in 1838 who was taken to Mauritius. Um, and in another um, of a um, indentured labourer called Betchu, who was the first Indian person to testify in front of a Royal Commission of Inquiry in, in the Caribbean. And um, so those can all actually, they're, they're really, they're short, and, but they're all wonderful. And they involve creative people from across the Indian indentured labour diaspora. And so I think it's the one, two, I think it's the third, it's the third message into um, the history of our chat. But it will give a lovely, I think it gives a lovely idea of, um, you know, of the variety of our stories and, and just the scope of the, the system of indenture. Brilliant. Yes, I just saw it. Thank you so much. Thanks, Maria. So there's uh, five minutes uh, left uh, for the for the ending of this event, which has been uh, has been wonderful. So I just want to um, ask if anyone has any final comments, please, you know, share in the um, in the chat if there are any kind of final, you know, quick final question. But I think we're sort of coming now to to the end. So yeah, I just want to thank you so much, Maria, for your sharing today and and for the work that you do. And yeah. No, thank you to you, Marta, and, uh, um, you know, for, for being part of it. It's lovely to do this with you, but um, also thanks to um, thanks to Class for having us, um, Jack, and uh, it's, been, it's been really lovely. Yes, absolutely. Thank you uh, to Class, and thank you to Eve and Jack as well.